On the morning of the 30th of June 1934, German Chancellor Adolf Hitler and a select group of armed SS men made their way to a lakeside hotel in Bavaria. Their goal was to arrest the heads of the SA, the Nazi paramilitary group. Ernst Röhm, the SA chief of staff, along with the other leading party members of the organization were to be rounded up and executed. The goal was to purge the Nazi party of its thuggish appearance, to rein in the power of a 4 million strong group and to pave the way for Hitler's total control of the German establishment in what became known as the Night of the Long Knives. In a series of brutal executions, Hitler and his Nazi party displayed the levels of cruelty and calculated malice that would typify their tyrannical rule. In today's video, we will cover the events that led to the Night of the Long Knives, just how the plot was carried out and how it led the path for Hitler to become the Führer. It is perhaps helpful to start with the rise of Ernst Röhm and the rise of the SA. Röhm served in the Imperial German Army during the First World War. During his time in the military, he sustained a number of injuries, including his trademark facial scar. By the time of the defeat of Germany, Ernst Röhm had reached the rank of captain. He, however, would not be quick to lay down his arms. He was one of the leading members of the Bavarian Freikorps. Such Freikorps groups sprang up across Germany, bands of former soldiers eager to take up arms against any communist or socialist revolts that were fomenting. It was in 1919, whilst still serving as a captain in the military, that Rome joined the Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, the party that would next year become the Nazi party. Even before Adolf Hitler joined, Rome was already an established member of the party, supplying funds and arms from the German army. He also acted as a conduit for other right-wing groups and veteran associations to form alliances and thereby grow the Nazi party. The SA or Sturmabteilung began as an ad hoc response to hecklers and those wishing to disrupt the Nazi party meetings. Nazi party members who were former soldiers acted as bodyguards, violently ejecting hecklers, socialists and communists from the beer halls where many of the early meetings took place. The group would be equipped with all manner of melee weapons and eventually given a uniform, from which the nickname of brown shirts would derive. During a time of great political and economic turmoil, the SA offered many out-of-work soldiers a place of camaraderie and the opportunity to engage in violence against those who were being held responsible. There was the dichotomy of the SA. On one hand, they presented as a force for order, being uniformed and parading through German cities, they had the appearance of being militaristic and organized. On the other hand, they were drunken rabble, engaging in street fights with political opponents and racial minorities. Many in the German establishment viewing the Nazis as little more than thugs. Many of the SA membership embraced the cult of personality Rome established. He wanted to create a militaristic space for like-minded men who embraced an almost Grecian view of masculinity and rejected or even hated women. Homosexuality was accepted within the SA, with Rome and many of his leadership being gay, in direct contradiction to the Nazis' hatred of homosexuals. Both Rome and the SA played a key role in Hitler's Munich Putsch, where the Nazis attempted to take power through violent means. This, however, failed, in large part due to the party not having the backing of the German military. Whilst a failure, it highlighted to Hitler that he needed to achieve power through legitimate means and gain the backing of the army. Hitler envisioned the SA as a tool to support the political goals of the party. It was to protect Nazi events, engaging in street fights with communists, and working as part of the propaganda wing of the party. But for many in the SA, Rome included, they saw themselves as a revolutionary army, which would eventually replace the German army. After all, the German army, under the terms of the Treaty of Versailles following World War I, was capped at only 100,000, and was dwarfed by the millions of brown shirts. As the Nazi party gained seats in the Reichstag parliament, the air of legitimacy grew. But all the while, the brown shirts utilized violence to help achieve the political dreams of the party. This included intimidations at polling stations, disrupting rival political rallies, and old-fashioned violence in the streets. 
By 1932, the Nazis were the largest single party in the Reichstag. And in the same year, Hitler was appointed Chancellor by the President Paul von Hindenburg. Following an arson attack on the Reichstag building, Hitler abolished civil liberties in Germany and began dismantling their democratic institutions. All that stood between him and complete power was President Hindenburg and the German army. On the 11th of April 1934, Hitler and General Werner von Blomberg met aboard the cruiser Deutschland to come up with an agreement. Hitler would leave this meeting having gained the army support in taking up the presidency upon Hindenburg's death. Hitler would have to remove the threat posed by the brown shirts and Rome's ambitions for a revolution. The key conspirators began their plots, eager to dispose of Rome and increase their own power within the party. Chief amongst them were Heinrich Himmler, head of the SS, and Himmler's deputy, Reinhard Heydrich. The SS were technically under the direction of the SA, though had a very different membership. It was far more selective and attracted more middle-class individuals. Rather than SS members buying into Rome's cult of personality, they were loyal to Hitler. They had been steadily gaining power, such as obtaining the control of the Gestapo secret police force. Himmler, Heydrich and Hermann Göring began the work of drawing up a list of people who were to be eliminated. This list became known as the Reich List of Unwanted Persons. Top of the list was Ernst Röhm, along with his deputy Edmund Heinz, along with a number of leading SA members. It was not, however, limited to just members of the SA. Other targets included Gregor Strasser, an early member of the Nazi party who was seen as the face of the socialist wing. Gustav von Kahr, a Bavarian secessionist who played a role in the defeat of the Munich Putsch and Fritz Gerlich, a journalist who had investigated the mysterious death of Hitler's niece. On the evening of the 28th of June 1934, Hitler phoned Rome to arrange a meeting of the SA leadership at the Hanselbau Hotel in Bad Wiesay. The meeting was arranged and would take place on the 30th of June. This was to take place at the time where much of the SA were on vacation, many of the leadership relaxing at the hotel. This was all part of the plot, to put the SA leadership at ease to gather them into one remote spot to allow for a quick and easy series of arrests. Operation Hummingbird, as it was called, was set to begin. At around 6.30am, Hitler and his SS assassins arrived at the hotel. According to Hitler's driver, Erich Kemke, the following went down. Hitler entered Rome's bedroom alone with a whip in his hands. Behind him were two detectives with pistols at the ready. He spat out the words, Rome, you're under arrest. Rome's doctor comes out of a room and to our surprise he has his wife with him. I hear Lutz put in a good word for him with Hitler. Then Hitler walks up to him, greets him, shakes hands with his wife and then asks them to leave the hotel. Now the bus arrives. Quickly, the SA leaders are collected from the laundry room and walk past Rome under police guard. Rome looks up from his coffee sadly and waves to them in a melancholy way. At last, Rome too is led from the hotel. He walks past Hitler with his head bowed, completely apathetic. Rome's deputy, Edmund Hines, was reportedly found in bed with his 18-year-old driver. Upon seeing such an act of blatant homosexuality, the pair were ordered to be summarily executed in the laundry room of the hotel and became the first victims of the Night of the Long Knives. Rome, along with a number of the SA leadership, were sent to the Stadelheim prison to await their fate. Those who resisted were shot and killed. For those SA leaders arriving at the hotel for the planned meeting, they were instead met by the SS and were promptly arrested. With this part of the plan a success, the call was made to commence the rest of Operation Hummingbird. All around Germany, specially selected hitmen made their way to their targets. All orchestrated by Himmler, Heydrich and Göring, ticking off names from the list as calls came in confirming another target eliminated. In Potsdam, General von Schleicher and his wife Elizabeth were gunned down by a group of trenchcoat and fedora-wearing assassins. The official Nazi line was that the general had resisted arrest while holding a weapon, and that the husband and his wife were shot in self-defense. In reality, it was little more than a gangland-style hit, with the pair riddled with bullets. 
Some of the targets were dragged and murdered at the Dachau concentration camp, including Fritz Gerlich. As a means of notifying his wife, the Nazis sent a pair of blood-covered spectacles. The Vice Chancellor Franz von Papen, who had previously publicly condemned the removal of civil liberties, managed to barely avoid the hit list and was instead removed from office. As for Rome, he was initially spared execution. Hitler had considered to pardon him on account of their friendship and for Rome's contributions to the growing Nazi party. Such a position was not tolerated by Himmler, Goring and Goebbels, who all helped Hitler to see that Rome should die. SS executioner Theodore Eich was selected to carry out the task, but first Rome was given the opportunity to take his own life with honour. Eich entered Rome's cell and placed a pistol on the table. Rome was given 10 minutes in which to use the pistol, but his response was, if Adolf wants to kill me, let him do the dirty work. 10 minutes later, Rome stood in the middle of his cell awaiting his execution. Ike and his adjutants returned and emptied their revolvers into the defiant Rome. It wasn't until the 13th of July that Hitler made the public aware of the purge. He gave a speech where he framed himself as the saviour of Germany from a treasonous plot, stating, In this hour I was responsible for the fate of the German people, and thereby I become the supreme judge of the German people. I gave the order to shoot the ringleaders in this treason. It's important to note that there was little evidence of such a plot. In fact, many of the SA leadership were loyal to Hitler, yet had been placed on the list by Göring or Himmler in a bid to further strengthen their own positions. Goebbels emphasised the homosexuality element of the SA in subsequent propaganda, justifying the purge as a crackdown against moral degradation. As for the German army, they had achieved their goals. The threat posed to their independence had been removed with the death of Rome and his loyal SA leadership. Though it had come at the cost of two generals, it was deemed as a small price to pay, and an amount of leverage that they believed they could hold against the Nazi party. Upon the death of President Hindenburg on the 1st of August 1934, Hitler was able to leverage his support from the military to ensure he would be able to absorb the presidential powers into his role as Chancellor creating the new position of Führer. As for the SA, it was stripped of any independence and now had to swear direct allegiance to Hitler. Its membership plummeted and any mention of Rome was purged from the likes of propaganda films. Its role would remain as a thuggish organisation, notably targeting Jewish-owned businesses and playing a major role in the Night of Broken Glass, which was a Nazi-directed pogrom. As the SA diminished, their SS rivals garnered even more power. Theodore Eich was placed in command of the Totemkov Brigade, the SS formation responsible for running the growing concentration camps of Nazi Germany. Reinhard Heydrich cemented his place as Himmler's number two man, and is largely regarded as the man responsible for answering the Jewish question with the Holocaust. As for Himmler, he was able to oversee the creation of ever more concentration camps, placing himself at the head of the primary tool for oppression in Nazi Germany. And in a grim mirror to Rome's dreams, the Waffen-SS, the military wing of the organisation, was able to expand from a ceremonial few hundred to almost a million strong, with panzer divisions and volunteers from all over Europe. It was the political, racially motivated and genocidal armed force of the Nazi state. The Night of the Long Knives can be seen as a clear indication as to the sort of regime the Nazis would build. One of internal squabbles and power grabs of key players, of those who pledge unswavering loyalty to Hitler on the rise and of those who stood in the way of being permanently disposed of. Hitler was able to continue his appeal to the German establishment the armed forces and the industrialists who had backed his movement. In a brutal consolidation of his power, Hitler ordered the deaths of at least 85 people, though the death toll may be in the hundreds. The Night of the Long Knives signalled the start of the Führer and of the complete and total control in the hands of one man, a man more than prepared to murder his former comrades in order to achieve total control. It was the first public example as to what fate would befall those who stood in the way of Hitler's visions and ambitions.